Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining our eighth webinar within the ECE Data Science Distinguished Series. Before presenting our, our distinguished speaker today, let me briefly go over some logistics. If you have any questions, you can write them in the Q&A chat, and towards the end of the talk, we're going to select some of those to be answered by our speaker. Uh, during the talk, I'll also monitor the Q&A in case there's any pressing clarification question that makes sense to address in the middle of the talk. Otherwise, we're going to address most of the questions towards the end. The talk will also be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel for future access. So that being said, it is uh, my pleasure to present today Professor Jose Moura, our distinguished uh, speaker for the Data Science Seminar. Professor Moura obtained his bachelor's in WLE from IST, the Superior Technical Institute or Instituto Superior Tecnico, which is my Spanish approximation to the true Portuguese pronunciation uh, in Lisbon, uh, Portugal. And he obtained his master's and doctorate degrees from uh, MIT this last one in 1975. He then went back to IST as a faculty member. And if I did my homework correctly, you said you basically became the equivalent of a full professor in IST in just four years in 1979, which is amazing. Uh, after a few visiting positions in 1986, he returned permanently to the US and became professor at CMU in electrical and computer engineering institution where he has been ever since, other than the occasional visiting position to his alma mater MIT. Apart from his departmental position at CMU, he currently holds the Philip L. and Marcia Dowd University Professor position. In terms of achievements, I know that this might sound cliche, but it is really hard to know where to start, so I'll keep it simple. Uh, he was the 2019 IEEE President and CEO, okay? not the Signal Processing Society President, which he also was a bit over a decade ago, but of the whole of IEEE. He was Editor-in-Chief for the Transaction Signal Processing, He's a fellow of IEEE, AAAS, and the US National Academy of Inventors. He holds an honorary doctorate from the University um, of um, Strathclyde in Glasgow. He's a corresponding member of the Academy of Science of Portugal and a member of the US National Academy of Engineering. He received the Great Cross of the Order of the Infante de Enrique, bestowed to him by the President of the Republic of Portugal. So I actually looked into this, and uh, the Great Cross is actually the second highest honor within this order and the highest honor which is the great color is usually reserved to heads of state so the great cross is as high as it gets unless uh, you say you're planning to run for president of portugal which which i don't know you might um on a different sphere a detector in two of his patterns with alec kapcic is uh, found over six in over 60 percent of these drives of all computers sold worldwide which led to a 750 million dollar settlement between cmu and marvel technology group on a personal note, Professor Morales has been uh, very influential on, on my career, his work. Uh, I remember back in 2014, actually, I think in both ICAS and Global SIP, Jose was presenting his work on graph signal processing, talking about interpolation using graph filters. And I thought uh, that's a very neat idea. And at that point, I kind of started working uh, full steam on the broad area of graph signal processing, which became a central theme uh, in my research ever since. So, so Jose, thank you very much for spending the afternoon with us. We are very happy to have you here, and the floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Santiago. I think you should have uh, reduced that uh, great introduction to uh, a, a couple of seconds, not minutes. But uh, um, you should never believe what the introduction <laughs> is all about. So it's a great pleasure to be here because uh, of the many uh, distinguished people that, uh, that uh, work in, in signal processing and have been working for so many years at Rice and uh, uh, many good friends there. Um, so so um, when uh, Santiago invited me, uh, I thought to myself, am I gonna uh, speak to this uh, August uh, audience and they know everything that I know about signal processing and much more or what. And, uh, and so uh, I, I'm afraid that what I'm going to uh, tell you today is, uh, uh, is things that you already know. Maybe the only twist is, uh, is on the way I'm uh, presenting and relating them. So having said that, let me first um, acknowledge uh, if this works. Uh, it's not working. Yago, what's going on? Okay. My collaborators and uh, uh, here um, on the left, uh, 
me see, I won't point their options. Here is uh, Sandri Ayla, he was postdoc, he's now, if I'm not mistaken, at Amazon. Joya was a graduate student, uh, she's now at NVIDIA. Jonathan is uh, in some startup, uh, he is uh, the kind of that, uh, that type of person. John is a grad student, uh, doctoral grad student now. Mark is a graduate student. Lavender is a rising senior. Oh my goodness, João is uh, hiding behind Lavender here. Chris is a senior, a rising senior. And Oren is a, research, uh, a researcher at the Software Engineering Institute. And, uh, and so over the years, I've worked with uh, them in different aspects uh, on what I'll be talking about. And uh, with all of these, uh, I'll be referring to parts of work uh, uh, that they are working uh, on and teaching me about. So of course, uh, what we are talking about today is one aspect uh, of data that, uh, uh, that uh, became prevalent. Uh, and I like to say that this is the era we are living uh, where data is everywhere and uh, being everywhere means also that uh, uh, as very different uh, is of very different types and i'm illustrating here just uh, just for the sake this is kind of a marketing uh, type uh, data set uh, where customers uh, of a cell phone provider uh, uh, interconnect uh, and you see different colors that's the signal I'm not going into the details. This is a very uh, famous um, data set of hyperlink blogs and the different colors represent uh, the leanings, the leanings of the, um, the bloggers and the, 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 which bloggers they follow are the edges in this graph. This is a very old uh, uh, social network that I extracted from my LinkedIn. Unfortunately, you can't uh, I think that LinkedIn no longer provides that tool uh, where you could extract your own uh, network of contacts in LinkedIn. Uh, this, of course, is a physical uh, physical sensor network. So, so physics uh, so physical signals are are still of, uh, of relevance. Uh, this is a commercial network. Companies uh, were interconnected by uh, by their customer, other companies to which they sell their products or from which they, they buy components, whatever. And this is a, an example of a citation network. Uh, for example, authors uh, that, uh, that uh, write papers and the papers cite either other papers and so forth. So a, a, an extremely rich variety. variety. And um, I think that uh, what I would like to today is to kind of build, uh, build uh, and, uh, and uh, and kind of uh, understand uh, uh, in the context of uh, something that uh, that everybody uh, is uh, looking around nowadays, uh, which is of course uh, um, uh, deep learning and issues uh, like classification and stuff like that. So, how is it that uh, we should uh, uh, look at uh, these architectures, these uh, processing uh, structures? and uh, modify them when the data is no longer images uh, or audio or speech or things of that sort, but these more uh, arbitrary kind of. And, uh, and that's where people refer to, okay, that's the geometry of the data. And uh, as was obvious from the previous examples and from this example, the geometry is really what captures that geometry is really the graph, the underlying graph. And uh, does it matter to, uh, to, uh, to account for that in your structures? And here is an example I will return to and the talk more or less is to say how you modify that deep learning architecture in a sense to take care of this geometry of this graph. You see here that, uh, that uh, if you have, uh, uh, if your data and your task is to classify nodes in this graph, given a given uh, the label of a few of the nodes in the graph, well, if you totally ignore the the structure of the graph uh, and you train your deep learning or uh, deep learner and so forth, you essentially get the performance that uh, that uh, evolves like this as you increase the number 
of nodes uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that are labeled that uh, you have access to. But uh, if you do take care of the graph structure, then you have a very significant improvement. And so how do you do, do that and why and uh, what's the way to do that? In a sense, that's, uh, that's what I would like to, to talk about. So I'll return to this example uh, towards the end of the talk. So let me, um, um, the, before I, I actually get into that, let me, um, that's something that, uh, that, that I, I, I find interesting, which is in the early 2000s, this new term came about. I think there was a, 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 um, a, a study by the National Academy um, that essentially uh, looked at the comp look, looked at at the, the role that graphs were playing and came uh, I think came up with this term network science. So of course, these were the physicists that were looking into the complexity the complexity of systems. Uh, physicists like to look at complexity and they, they focused uh, very much attention in the early 2000s and since then in uh, analyzing that. And But I want to contrast that with uh, what uh, we are going to uh, essentially refer to as data science. But in both cases, there is a, a geometry captured by, by a graph. Um, so I'll first uh, look at this, uh, then uh, um, then uh, I'll expand uh, on the, this part of data science when the graph is taken into consideration, and uh, towards the end uh, I'll, uh, I'll illustrate with uh, uh, some issues, some issues uh, uh, from from GSP, and then return to the return to the, the classification example that is illustrated here. So, network science, as I said, they capture graphs. Uh, the, 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 the data, the, 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 there is a geometry also captured by a graph. But the questions that usually uh, um, people ask, you see this graph, uh, all the nodes, essentially everything is gray. So you don't distinguish the data here. There is no real data. The graph itself, captured the, what's relevant about the data. And a very interesting example is this 15th century Florentine marriages. This is a, a study and data collected by Paget and, and Ansel in 1993 in a journal in sociology. And basically what they were trying to, to ask, the question they really asked or they, they tried to answer and uh, that uh, people have been trying to answer by analyzing the structure of this graph is why were the Medici's, which are here, so relevant, so dominant among the 14 or 15 Florentine families of the uh, 1400s of the 15th century. And uh, what uh, Paget uh, and Ansel did uh, is they looked at the, the relations among these families through marriage. And by the way, uh, there is a very nice Netflix, um, Netflix um, 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 what is it, uh, which is called exactly the, the Medici's, it's uh, three or four seasons. And if you have the time and the patience, uh, it's interesting uh, to see how, and, and, and uh, it confirms in a sense uh, what the uh, budget Ansel were doing, uh, which is uh, what are the interrelations among families through marriage? And the Medici's played that in a very smart way. And so when you put, the, when you construct this graph of these interrelations, capturing the marriages between families. And then you've tried to analyze the graph by asking the question, what's the, uh, um, for each node, uh, uh, in how many, how many shortest paths between any two nodes um, um, does this family, uh, is this family in, the, in those shortest paths that's called the in between this uh, coefficient you'll find that the Medici beat all the others by a very significant, uh, I think the Medici's 
bit, uh, have uh, an in-betweenness that is maybe 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and uh, the next one is maybe half or one third of that, which means the Medici's were placing their, uh, were, were promoting the marriages of uh, their members with other families. So when the other families wanted to, to enter into business, it was easy to involve the Medici's. This is not really how the, the Netflix uh, um, series uh, explains it, but uh, the marriages do play a role there. But anyway, what's important here is that in network science, from my perspective, you, uh, you have your data, you capture what's relevant about the data in the graph, and then you address the questions and you find the answers by analysis of the structure of the graph. So that's not really what data science is. And I'm illustrating here the difference between a graph for a network science type question where the structure is what's relevant with a data science kind of graph where we go in and we label or paint or assign numbers or assign values data to the nodes of the graph. So the nodes of the graph still capture relations between this data, but besides the graph, there is also the data. Some people call it features, whatever. And, um, and so what uh, we want is really how to, to use both the, the structure of the graph in the context of analyzing processing the data. So uh, let me detour here and uh, um, remind you, and of course you know this very well, um, of the traditional DSP, the discrete signal processing. So, um, so this would be like the data science of time signals. And I, I went on the web, found this nice signal here. Um, this is the time signal. So these are the, the samples in time. These are the magnitudes or the amplitudes of the, of the signal. And uh, one thing that we do when we process these signals, so here are the time samples, is of course we weight them with these complex exponentials, then uh, we sum them up, uh, normalize, uh, and then we get the Fourier, the Fourier coefficient. So this x case, there are n, n of them as there are n of these. So this is in discrete time signal processing, that's the, this, uh, the, the discrete Fourier transform, and you get this. And so when you put all the x case together, you get this alternative description of your data. And we all know that I can go from the uh, Xn's to the X case. And of course I can go to, from the S X case to the Xn. So these are simply two different ways of describing the same data. <clears throat> and uh, one interesting thing that is that of course, uh, here is my signal. Now uh, I couldn't find something with the same. So I found another uh, figure on the web. So here is your time signal again, and here is your uh, spectrum, like, like the blue things here are here now. And uh, what this is saying is that you build this, if you get this by superimposing or adding with uh, these weights, these uh, that I'm gonna call the spectral components, the spectral components of this time, the, of, of time signals, not of this time signal, but of time signals, spectral components. And these spectral components are really the harmonics with which we build this time signal as a superposition of these uh, harmonics weighted by, by, by these, uh, these coefficients here. So um, repeating that, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the same thing, but I'm gonna use a vector notation. So I'm going to make a lots of simplicities here. I'm going to assume that we have a finite number of samples only. We are going to assume that uh, the samples, instead of being on a line, they are actually on the unit circle and so the, on, on the circle. And so they go around, uh, which means uh, I'm in, in an alternative way. I have a, a, period, a periodic, a periodic discrete uh, sequence. So I only care about these n samples. And, uh, um, and so I'm gonna uh, do the same thing for, I'm gonna collect my N uh, uh, Fourier coefficients here on this vector. And then of course the, the, uh, the Fourier transform that I had here going from the red to the blue 
is really now a, which is this thing here, right, that I had in the previous slide, now becomes a matrix vector multiplication. I go from a vector, the vector of time samples, to the vector of uh, uh, Fourier coefficients by multiplication by this matrix that captures this thing here. And this, of course, is the discrete Fourier transform. So I told you I was going to tell you things that you already know. So back to this, um, um, I, I do want to emphasize this notion here of the spectral components. The spectral components, which are the elements with which I build my signals, okay, they are not really the columns of the DFT, but they are the columns of the inverse, actually, the columns of the inverse of the DFT. The DFT is actually a very nice operator because it's unitary, so the inverse is simply the, the conjugate. It's simply the conjugate of the matrix. The matrix is symmetric, so you take the conjugate, the minus that were here in these, uh, uh, these exponents all become pluses, and uh, I build my signal X, I build my signal X, from the columns of this matrix, and those are the spectral components, okay? And that's what uh, it's illustrated here, and, um, um, and I guess I'm repeating myself here, and so uh, here I'm showing the data, the original time data, as being a superposition of these columns. So these play the role of the harmonics. These are the harmonics, okay? These are the harmonics. And so these spectral components are the harmonics in the time, and the weights are, of course, the, the Fourier coefficients. Okay, so, so, so nice. Another thing that uh, I want to remind you, of course, is uh, filtering, filtering uh, by convolution, as we know. And uh, uh, the same thing happens if I put my, if I collect the output uh, of the, my filter here uh, over time and, uh, and I, I collect uh, my input samples here, then this is a linear system. It becomes a, uh, a linear, and I'm going to assume a linear time invariant system. So this becomes a, uh, a, um, a matrix vector. So filtering now is a matrix vector. And the matrix, of course, uh, has this nice pattern, is a circular matrix, uh, as we all know, and so uh, as, as this structure. Very good. So looking at this matrix, you can see the H zeros here, the coefficient H zero here, the HN minus one's there, the H one's there, then the H one's here and so forth. And so you realize that as a circular matrix, we all know that if I introduce this matrix A, that circular matrix can be written as powers. Uh, this should be, uh, no, this is, so this is the power zero of the matrix. So it's the identity. Then this is power one of the matrix, power uh, squares cube up to n minus one. So I can build my filter as a polynomial in essence on this A matrix, on this A matrix. Okay, that's the polynomial. Okay, I don't need necessarily to go up to n minus one, but uh, um, uh, at most we go up to this degree here. So that's nice, that's in linear time invariant uh, um, uh, finite support with periodic boundary conditions, that's what we are doing here. Uh, the, the filters are, are these polynomials in this A matrix here that I'm calling a, a cycle, cycle matrix. So what's the relation then? So I, I gave you two things, one is the the DFT, the Fourier transform, the other is this, uh, this uh, polynomial filters. The polynomial filters are very nice because they relate to this A. So if I'm processing, if I'm doing any, any, um, any uh, filtering, then uh, you see only the, the, the only degrees of freedom are these H's here, this, uh, these uh, N coefficients, which is nice in terms of filter design. That will be that will be very nice. So the question is, what about the, the, the DFT? Do I need to uh, to come up with um, with uh, a new object uh, besides this cycle uh, shift? Well, we all know that uh, the, the the cycle shift and the DFT are very well related uh, by, by this diagonalization. So so here is the DFT again. 
and uh, here is the, the matrix, which is the inverse of this one, and which collects the harmonics or the spectral components, and uh, they diagonalize, they diagonalize the, the cycle shift. And, um, and so what I have is DFT minus one lambda DFT, lambda is this diagonal matrix. And of course, uh, the frequencies, what we usually uh, call frequencies actually is not this, uh, sometimes it's, the, it's the, the, the values here on the diagonal, sometimes it's the exponents. In this, uh, in this talk, I'm actually going to refer to the frequencies or the graph frequencies as the diagonals, diagonal entries here, not the exponents. But anyway, this is a, a DSP in a, in a nutshell. So we have signals, we have filters. The filters are polynomials of A. We have transforms. I didn't mention the Z transform. I could go, but uh, mention the Fourier transform and the Fourier transform, as uh, we saw, uh, diagonalizes the shift. So it goes back to the shift. So if I, I, did, if I uh, choose the shift, I have filters, I have uh, the Fourier. Uh, and so this becomes uh, becomes the, the the basic building block uh, or, or of DSPs. This is this shift. <clears throat> and so, what's the geometry of time signals? Did I mention anything about geometry? Well, let's see if there is a geometry. We have the cycle cyclic shift here, and the cyclic shift is this nice matrix of zeros and ones. Everything that is missing here is a zero. So we know that uh, anyone that has looked at graphs immediately says, "Oh, gee, this is really." This is really a graph, it's the cycle graph. So if I, instead of calling this, this a shift, I call this an adjacency matrix, then I have this, uh, this uh, cycle graph where, um, where I am labeling from zero to n minus one the rows and zero to n minus one the columns. And so if I look at the column, I'll have node zero, uh, where I have one it connects to that node one, that node one, so node zero collects a node one. And, um, this last node n minus one connects to node zero and so it cycles back okay this is a directed graph it's very interesting so although we don't mention that when we teach dsp or signals and systems the fact is that the dsp does capture the geometry of the time signals and the geometry is uh, is this uh, is this uh, uh, the cycle is this a directed cycle graph so now I shift gears and I go to graph signal processing and I already told the whole story because now I simply uh, do it in reverse order. So graph based data, start with a graph. And so you have your adjacency matrix here can be weighted, the weighted adjacency matrix can be very, these are the, the nodes, the label of the nodes. And uh, these connections, of course, uh, represent this is represented by some adjacency matrix. But remember, now I have data. So I have this data. That's why we have different colors. So we have this data. So uh, the nodes have data assigned to them. So I have a graph. The V is the set of nodes, the Vs, the V0, V1. The A is the adjacency matrix, can be weighted. And uh, I have my data. Okay, and so the graph signal processing now is given this reality, we would like to process this, but we would like to design processing from some quote unquote basic principles. And since what we have been teaching our students for the last 50 or 60 years, since the late 40s, uh, whenever, whenever it started, uh, in DSP, we rebuild linear systems and, uh, and so forth, uh, what we are trying to do is replicate, replicate uh, the same thing, is uh, develop a DSP for graph-based data. So that's what we are trying to do. So we, in DSP, we started with uh, a shift and we said, well, uh, take the graph as having the, the shift as adjacency. Here we start from the graph. So, Let's do the reverse. Let's call the shift the adjacency matrix. Now, this is a choice, arbitrary choice. It says, as any, as we know, we, we arbitrarily make choices. Like in optimization, we choose an optimization cost function. And then we try from our initial choices, hopefully very few choices, we try to design a theory. So what I'm trying to say here is that this is a possible choice, but you can come in and say, this is the wrong choice. Let me put a different, 
a different shift matrix. What's important is that once you have chosen a, ch a shift, whatever your choice is, be consistent in developing this theory, which tries to mimic the DSP theory. So starts by filters. Well, if you assume that the filters are shift invariant, which in this case means if I start by shifting the input and then filter, I would like this to be the same as if I filter first and then shift the output. So that's the shift invariance of DSP. If you assume that, and in this case, if you make another assumption, which essentially has to do with the structure of this shift that you chose, like in, uh, in jargon, linear algebra jargon, the minimum polynomial, minimum polynomial of A to be equal to its characteristic polynomial, that's a technical issue, then any filter in that is shift invariant under this assumption on A becomes a polynomial filter. So that's uh, the, just like we had before here, I'm illustrating that the K is less than or equal to N. Uh, before I had said N, but it can be, uh, the graph Fourier transform, well, it's exactly like before, just uh, diagonalize the shift. And uh, the thing on the right should be your graph Fourier transform. The signal on the left is the inverse of this one. And uh, this should be, I'm going to assume uh, that I am able to diagonalize the A. Uh, the, the things on the diagonal will be my graph frequencies. So I can uh, recover. So th this is the, the graph Fourier transform of my data. So remember, my data is a vector. I collect all the data, all the, the, the values uh, assigned to the different nodes. I collect uh, them in this vector. I take the GFT uh, of the data, which is multiplication by that thing. I get my, my graph Fourier transform. Okay, if I represent this GFT by, by these vectors, the row vectors, then uh, it's like the inner product of this row vector by this and so, so forth. That's my X here. So these will be this W0 dot X and so forth. These will be my graph Fourier uh, coefficients of this theta X. Uh, and uh, I can represent, as I said before, the data in terms of the harmonics. Now the harmonics, I'm not going to call them harmonics because that's really tied to the to the time signals, but I'm going to call them the spectral graph spectral components. That's why I kept uh, referring to them as graph spectral components, which are the columns of this matrix here, which is the inverse of that matrix. So if I write them as V0, then my X, I have this representation of the X in terms of the X hat, when I choose as basis, not the standard basis, but uh, these spectral components, which are the columns of this. And so I get this, okay? Okay, and the frequencies I told you would be the diagonal entries of that lambda matrix that sits in between the diagonalization of the, of the shift. And these are my graph frequencies <laughs> and they are complex numbers. And uh, um, I just want to note that uh, I have these two matrices, okay? I have the, the GFT, I remember I put the H on the Ws, now I put the H there so that I have a column matrix here. And uh, the GFT minus one, these are the spectral components. So I have these two, base, two different bases and of course, we all know that if I multiply GFT by GFT minus one, I get the identity. So these vectors are orthogonal to our two orthogonal systems. And so I have, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, what I mean is that these vectors are orthogonal to these vectors here. These vectors here are not orthogonal among themselves. They are linearly independent under this diagonalization assumption. They are linearly independent. These are linearly independent, but in general, for, a, for a, uh, some arbitrary shift, they are not necessarily orthogonal, okay? And so this GFT minus one is not GFT of H, but these are orthogonal to that. So we have a bi-orthogonal system. And uh, for example, you can get your Percival's theorem, uh, the corresponding graph Percival's theorem. I'm not gonna go through this, but, uh, but uh, you'd have uh, accepted it's different from the usual time time first of all because you have to use the bi-orthogonal. 
the, the Fourier filtering, we do have a graph uh, Fourier filtering theory, just like we have. A, so if I start uh, with the, my filter, so I'm filtering the X by this H matrix, which I told you is a, is a polynomial in A. So I, I diagonalize the A. And of course, now, because it's a polynomial, I can factor this out to the left, this to the right. So if I start with my data X, if I start with my data X, and then uh, I put this up outside. So I'm taking the Fourier transform, the graph Fourier transform with GFT. So I got the X hat. And then uh, because I took this out, the only thing left, it's the H of delta. And so that's the filtering in the spectral domain. This is a diagonal matrix. This is a diagonal matrix. This is a vector. And so basically what this is, is a pointwise point uh, product of, uh, of the vector of the diagonal entries here with this, which as we know, it's a pointwise multiplication that's filtering in the spectral domain. Oops. And uh, finally, I take the GFT minus one to get back to the output in the node domain. And so back to the node domain by this. So this is exactly like if I take out the graph, like the Fourier filtering that you go, you go with successive uh, Fourier transforms uh, and inverse Fourier transforms to make uh, uh, filtering much easier in the spectral domain. So um, there is one issue that I want to, to tell you about. And the issue is that I, I told you there are many different options for shifts and people over have uh, worked with different, made different choices, make different assumptions. So for example, uh, one of the original papers uh, made a choice uh, of developing this theory based on a shift that is the graph Laplacian. They took us, the reason they did that is because they actually came to this through the spectral domain and the spectral domain making associations with the, the Laplacian and the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. They built the Laplacian and so they built a graph signal processing coming from that, that the, with a big advantage because uh, then it's uh, uh, diagonalized by uh, unitary transformation. Uh, remember that the graph Laplacian is positive semi-definite uh, um, and um, and um, is symmetric positive semi-definite. So it's diagonalized by a unitary transformation. So it's guaranteed that the, the spectral components, its Fourier basis is an orthogonal system. The vectors are orthogonal. Um, other assumptions, and I think uh, uh, Santiago, in some of the papers you make, uh, some of your papers, uh, you make this assumption you assume that A is normal. So this is uh, uh, more general than, than this one, uh, but still is diagonalizable by a unitary transformation. So the, the good thing about these uh, is uh, you avoid many of the numerical issues in computing that Fourier basis, the columns, the spectral components, the graph spectral components. When we uh, uh, looked at this, we actually, because we came from a different direction, we came from uh, some work that uh, I had done previously with uh, a colleague, Marcus Puschel, who is now a professor at, uh, at the ETH, um, but at the time he was at CMU. Uh, uh, with Marcus, we had developed something we called algebraic signal processing and Based on that, we kind with Sandri Ayla, who was a postdoc, um, um, we came to this from a different point of view, as I explained to you, from the associating the shift with the adjacency matrix. And so the adjacency matrix is arbitrary to arbitrary graphs. So in particular, they can be directed graphs. And direct graphs accept for a few exceptions, like the time graph, like the cycle graph, are not diagonalizable by unitary transformations. And, um, and so if that's the case, then we do have numerical issues because you are trying to build, uh, trying to find the spectral components uh, of, uh, of, uh, the, from, uh, um, the, that are not orthogonal, that are not orthogonal. Um, and, and it, it, often in practice, the problem is that some of the eigenvalues are very small. And uh, this leads to numerical issues 
and uh, with um, with João, who is um, who was a visitor. Um, he's now back in Portugal, but uh, he spent six or seven months uh, at CMU a year ago. Um, uh, we developed a kind of a way where we try to achieve a compromise between the numerical stability of the Fourier basis. Fourier basis this year is this is the, the GFT minus one. Uh, it's, uh, we call it half here for Fourier basis. A is the shift. So, and this is uh, F lambda. So if you put this F on this side here, F minus one, it would be A being diagonalized by the F and the F minus one. So we try to, to make this error in the Frobenius norm, could be some other norm, but we try to make this very small, but at the same time, keep the F as being uh, numerically stable. And the numerical stability is through the minimum singular value. So the minimum singular value has to be larger than, than some alpha, small alpha. Now, um, this here um, is achieved. The, 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 the initial idea was, okay, let's start an algorithm where we iterate, as uh, we'll see, where we start from a triangular, a triangular decomposition of A, a triangular decomposition of A. So let me show, show here. So, so we start by picking two small quantities, and we start with a triagonal decomposition. This triagonal decomposition is numerically stable, okay? And uh, this uh, F0 is actually a unitary matrix, and this T0 is a, a triangular matrix and the diagonal entries are going to be the, the, the eigenvalues of A. So the eigenvalues of A. And then you, eat, uh, re, and then you iterate. You are trying, the iterations are going to try to reduce this, tri, tri, this uh, triangular matrix to a diagonal matrix, to a diagonal matrix. So at every step of the iteration, you are go going to, um, to downsize, you multiply all the entries all the entries of the matrix, of this matrix here, this is the, the current version of this initial. So it's still the still upper triangular, uh, except the diagonal entries. You want to keep the diagonal entries uh, uh, fixed, but all the entries above the, the main diagonal are, are multiplied by, uh, by uh, are downsized by a small factor beta. And uh, the, the step, uh, the second step of this uh, recursion here is you then uh, um, <clears throat> subject to the constraint that we had before, AF being F, what we would like here is the lambda. So the T is gonna tend ten tendentially to the lambda. Um, um, you try to, to find the, the F that is the closest to, to the current version of FK, remembering that we started with the, some F0. And so you iterate this and you stop, you test at every step what is the, the, the sigma mean of this so that you keep, uh, keep this with, uh, within uh, a certain, um, a certain uh, numerical accuracy. And the results are actually, this is the Adamic Glantz uh, uh, data set for the 2004 presidential election. This uh, is uh, 1500 hyperlink blogs. The blogs, the colors represent uh, the, the liberal and conservative tendencies of the bloggers and the blogs uh, follow other bloggers. And so you construct a graph. And, uh, and uh, the, from that graph, there are, about it. So we see here 1500, the number of edges in the graph, I don't remember now, but there are several thousand. But anyway, out of the 1500 the eigenvalues of this adjacency matrix, which is directed, is directed, um, many of those, uh, several hundred of them are pretty close to zero. So this is a very unstable, if you go to MATLAB, um, unfortunately, uh, if you use uh, with double precision or whatever precision you can get in MATLAB, you will get the sigma mean for the resulting F that is like 10 to the minus 30 or something like that. It's extremely numerically unstable. And so 
But uh, with this algorithm, you see that depending on the F, on the betas, beta is the factor with which you downsize the, the upper diagonal entries. You see that as you reduce the beta, so this is uh, showing uh, uh, the, this beta 0.99 is here. If at each stage you reduced only a little bit the, 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 the upper triangular towards the, the diagonal matrix you want, or if you use a much smaller beta, you can see that uh, you get much better results and much faster. This is number of iterations. This is the error. Now remember that uh, here the error is uh, 10, is like 10 to the zero, so it's like one or a fraction of one. But remember that this is 1500. So there are, there are on these matrices here, there are about uh, 1500 squares, so it's like uh, two million entries. So the the error, except for the except for the diagonal, the errors here are very small because it's uh, this is the Frobenius norm, so it's adding over all. And uh, another example is uh, um, I've uh, I've uh, done work. Uh, on analyzing traffic uh, in uh, the Manhattan uh, in Manhattan, and so we constructed the graph uh, of the roadmap. Uh, it's about uh, um, depending on how you construct that graph. It's uh, in this example here. It's about uh, 5,500 nodes, and uh, so the matrix again the same thing happens. That uh, this uh, 15 this 5,500 eigenvalues close to 1,000 are pretty close to zero, okay? So being pretty close to zero, again, if you try to do the eigen decomposition of the adjacency matrix of this graph here with these 5,500 uh, nodes, you get, again, with MATLAB, a very unstable matrix. With this algorithm, um, this being the error uh, for Binus norm, again, uh, the F, the Fourier basis, which is the inverse of the GFT, uh, again, um, with the number of iterations and uh, with the appropriate beta, you can get uh, a, a very, a very um, accurate F. And I didn't tell you what the alpha is, but the alpha is a parameter you choose. So you pick the, the numerical stability you want for the resulting F. I think in, the, in both of these, we played with the alphas between uh, 0 0.1, uh, I'm sorry, between one and 10 to the minus five. <clears throat> and uh, here, here are examples for the roadmap of the, of the, um, of the um, eigenfunctions of the um, spectral components. Okay, and they are ordered. Uh, I didn't tell you how we ordered from low pass to high pass, but uh, you can do that. They are ordered uh, from low pass to high pass according to a certain certain way. Okay, so I, I, I did a quick coverage of some topics, the basics. There has been a lot of work. Uh, of course, uh, it would take uh, uh, many more lectures. Sampling is a topic that uh, has been uh, uh, the subject of a lot of work. Uh, I'm not, of course, including here everybody's name because uh, this is just uh, an arbitrary sample. Um, uh, Santiago, I know that you also did work on sampling, but uh, you're, I decided to include your name here. Another topic, which is stationary of uh, of, uh, of uh, the graph signals, it's uh, it's uh, um, uh, a, very, a very interesting topic. Uh, with uh, one thing that in, in GSP happens is that uh, while concepts in DSP, in traditional DSP, have a, have practically either an accepted definition or really, when you look at it, there is no other way of defining it. In many of these things, just starting from the the the, the um, just starting from the shift that I told you, there are they, it's a total degree of freedom. Once you move away from the cycle shift for time signals, it's uh, it depends on how you define it. Uh, for all for many of these, there is this similar. So stationarity is an example. Um, uh, Cigar and co-authors, they define it in a certain way, others define 
in slightly different ways. And then there are the applications. Uh, I went on the web uh, preparing for this talk and I entered graph signal processing on Google uh, Scholar and were pages and pages and pages. And I wanted to figure out what are the interesting applications. And uh, I, I got tired. I just took arbitrary things from the first uh, page or, or the first two pages. And this is local disaggregation. I'm sorry, load disaggregation in uh, power, uh, power appliances, uh, functional brain, uh, brain imaging, identification of network structure, uh, SAR imaging, denoising, and, and so forth. So let me go back to my motivation. And this has to do with looking at the deep learning, but now accounting for the graph, the geometry of the data that I told you is captured by the graph. And I think that the, the original work here uh, goes back to Bruna um, uh, Zaremba Slam Lekun um, in an ICLR paper in 2014. Maybe there are earlier papers by Bruna, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, there is a very nice review about uh, two or three years ago in the Signal Processing Magazine of IEEE. And they take uh, an approach here that I would uh, say it's a spectral based approach. Okay. And uh, myself uh, and uh, colleagues and uh, uh, Kip and Welling actually departed, also started from this spectral approach, but then made a certain number of approximations and a certain number of uh, steps and essentially fell into an approach that uh, uh, I'm going to call that is uh, uh, node-based uh, node based, uh, or uh, um, nodal-based. So this is spectral, working from the spectral domain, this is more from the nodal base. And I'm really going to focus on only in terms of uh, of uh, what I want to say here, given that I don't have much time, I'm going to uh, go with these two. So the problem, as I mentioned, was we have data captured by this graph, and there, is, there are these uh, this gain here that is significant if you account in your deep learning classifier, if you account for geometry of the data. So how do you do that? Well, let's look at the architecture of a CNN. The architecture of a CNN here, very extremely simplified, is convolution steps. And there are several layers of this. So that's these three dots here. Convolution, uh, which people call convolution, but it's really a correlation, but we'll go with convolution. And then followed usually by a nonlinear activation step. Then uh, uh, from time to time you do pooling, which is uh, you throw away in some some systematic way. You throw away many of the pixels and values here, and uh, you create a, a smaller version of this by pooling. It's like sampling, let's say. And then uh, at the end, there is some, uh, after several stages of this, there is some fully connected uh, and, uh, and uh, that's uh, and, uh, your classifier. And this convolution, of course, is what is you have some, uh, some uh, filter and you, you slide the filters through your, your data and uh, you construct the output, okay? And, um, and that's, and that's the traditional, the, the usual, and the, this applies very well to lattice-based data, lattice-based data. Now, um, when we talk about uh, how do we do this now for graph-based data, of course, there are many aspects that we should be considering. We should be considering the convolution step, the number of layers, the pooling, the, the, because we have graphs, graphs, uh, um, as you move uh, along the along the arch along the deep learning deep learner, uh, you can get different dimensions, and so there is an issue at the end that uh, you might be looking at uh, at uh, uh, at objects with different dimensions. So there is usually a step in this graph deep learning uh, geometric deep learning uh, of aggregation and many other aspects. I'm only going to focus on this one here. And so I repeat the architecture, except now this is graph-based data. It's no longer, no longer um, an image. So I have a graph and uh, the convolution has to be appropriately defined. And here is an example I'm going to use for the convolution. The, the way I define the, 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 the filters 
uh, I told you that the filters were under certain conditions polynomial filters. Polynomial filters, of course, have degrees, have coefficients. And so, for example, here is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a graph filter of degree two, which means I, I go up to two nearest neighbors. Here is one of the degree three, so I go up to three nearest neighbors um, and, and things of that sort. So these are all hyperparameters, the degree of the polynomial hyperparameters to be optimized in the, the training phase. I'm not going to discuss that. So just to show some of the results, here is node classification um, with these three data sets. This is uh, what's called the site seer. Uh, this is Cora and this is PubMed. And the, the numbers, uh, I just put this here for the number of nodes. So the core is about 3,000, this is also about 3,000, and this is about 20,000. And uh, here are the results. And the only thing I'm showing here is GCN is a, a first order polynomial, while this one actually optimizes over the order of polynomials. And of course, there is also an, or, an optimization over the number of layers. And we did this in such a way that the number of layers times the degree of the polynomial in both cases is more or less the same. And so you see that the performance uh, over, um, um, it, it, it has an impact on how you design these things. And this is just uh, another problem, which is called graph classification. I don't have time to go through all the details. These are data sets that uh, uh, are standard data sets in, the, in these issues. Um, and uh, uh, what this means, for example, the mood tag is you, the problem, the task is to distinguish from a few exemplars that are labeled for you, distinguish if this belongs to class one of, uh, to the molecule type one or the molecule of type two. So the same molecule can have different, uh, different uh, graph versions. So it's not a, a problem of saying, oh, this graph is different from that one. It's within the class of graphs representing a given molecule and given the class of graphs represent a different molecule, can I learn can I learn to classify this? And uh, um, uh, again, uh, here, uh, what I have uh, at the bottom also is different, uh, different um, pooling methods. I don't have the time to go. And uh, uh, for different data sets, different uh, options, uh, um, um, different options. Here I brought uh, another, another that I don't have the time. You get to, to explain, you get uh, uh, performance relatively close, but as you know, with deep learning, uh, any fraction uh, of the performance, uh, people, uh, people are very happy. And this is uh, with a different data set. Let me, let me move on. So basically what I, what I gave you, uh, basically what I'm saying is that um, um, data comes in uh, very different ways, very different applications, very different domains. We should, we should use what we have, the underlying structure of the indexing set. In the past, with images uh, and, uh, and time signals, we kind of uh, ignored or thought that we were ignoring. But uh, with the, the new types of data, that clearly plays a big role. And so the graph structure that captures that geometry is very important. Graph signal processing, is a way of trying to derive, trying to, to develop from with a, a certain methodology, a certain, uh, a certain, say you make a few choices and then you follow a, a certain number of steps to build your processing algorithms. Um, um, the, major, the, the, the major block is, uh, the major choice degree of freedom is this, that determines, for example, the Fourier analysis, the spectral analysis, determines the filtering analysis, determines other things that uh, I did cover. And finally, I illustrated to you in one very uh, specific application that by taking into account the structure of uh, the data, the underlying geometry, you actually can get uh, uh, significant uh, gains. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Jose. Thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, so yeah, so this is the time for, for questions. So let's take a few minutes uh, for questions. Uh, I see that we have one already coming in. 
So, uh, so remember, people, you can write uh, the questions here in the Q and A, and you say we'll uh, we'll go over these. So let's start with this one. So uh, Sad uh, tells us a very nice linkage between GSP and conventional signal processing. Uh, he asks, is there a similar linkage for stochastic signals, for example, with principal component analysis on random graphs? That's a very interesting question. So first of all, that goes back to the stationarity issues and uh, uh, Anton, um, Santiago has done work, as I mentioned, and so he can uh, actually uh, maybe be much more precise than I am on my answer. But uh, uh, yes, clearly. Um, the, the SVD, uh, actually, the SVD and the machine learning algorithms, they ignore the graph structure. But if you look at the data, and the data stacks, say, um, say or, um, along the rows, let's say, the columns represent uh, snapshots of the data, okay? And suppose that uh, you have data collected uh, over, say, uh, weather stations. So you have 150 weather stations. So you're going to get the, your data is 150 rows. And then say you have uh, one measurement per day over 365 days, so you have a 150 by 365 days. Now, temporally, when you do the SVD, you completely ignore both the time structure that is along the rows and the, the, the vertical structure, which is the graph based. Okay, you could fit a, a, a graph dependencies proximity of the weather stations and temporally so if you do svd of this x matrix and you get u sigma vh um, you have a basis that is fine-tuned to the particular data that that you are collecting what uh, we have done actually in some work is to try to um to represent both the columns and the rows to represent that data by uh, essentially some some form of a graph filter. Okay, so the second column is like related to the first column, and the relation is not just temporal, because I moved from the first to the second column is time, but it's also spatial because uh, along the column you have a graph structure. So you can bring that in. Okay. Now, um, how, if you do the SVD of that, basically what we are doing is looking, if the SVD was U sigma VH, you are looking at the U as doing a graph Fourier, a graph Fourier of the columns. So you are using a representation for, for the, for the, the the singular vectors in terms of the Fourier, in terms of the, the graph Fourier. So, um, but um, I haven't yet understand very well how you can uh, how we, you can use this to your advantage. But yeah, certainly that's a topic uh, that is a very interesting topic, and uh, mm -hmm. I. Think uh, uh, um, Santiago, did you and uh, and uh, Marquez, or maybe it was Marquez, that did some winner filters and things of that sort? Was it you? Uh, yes, yes. So in those yes, exactly. So in those cases, uh, they are yes. So we're thinking of uh, random processes on graphs. So the graphs that itself was fixed, right? So here you can think of you know have a random process on a fixed graph, so something evolving on, on on a graph that itself is evolving. So this this second context is harder certainly to pinpoint and I think there's much there haven't been too much on that for the first one yeah we we try to think of what you know why, white sense stationarity means in here and what would be the power spectral density of some of these processes and we kind of have pinpointed some of that and the the applications as Jose was mentioning in winner filtering uh, so sad I'd be happy to also you know continue this discussion if you want afterwards yeah. um, so here, uh, so I know it's it's uh, two or four already. Uh, we have uh, actually one. Uh, <laughs> it's a kind of a long question here. Uh, so in fact, when you say we know that we have a grand tissue theorem, these are two. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so so I think this has uh, more to do with you know which parts. I mean, you you mentioned this thing that when when going to general graphs and and this we can keep sure if you want, but you when going to general graph, you basically have to choose some things you can keep and some things you might lose, right? So uh, th there are certainly some things that when going to general directed graphs you will lose, maybe in terms of interpretation or maybe even in terms of mathematical rig rigorosity. Uh, so here, uh, Romain is asking about, you know, uh, when using the Laplacian matrix, we know that we have convergence towards the Laplace Beltrami operator, we have the current Fisher theorem. And what is the main argument in your case where you use directly uh, the adjacency matrix, right? So you will be losing some of these things, uh, maybe you are gaining some others. So um, that's a very interesting question. It's a kind of a philosophical question. Why do you choose A versus B? But uh, I do have very strong feelings about that, actually. So first of all, the L, if you go to, to spectral, the, graphs, uh, the spectral graph, you are dealing only with undirected graphs. And uh, we know that, for example, the time uh, cycle, uh, the time graph is a directed. So it's not an undirected, it's a directed. So you are developing a theory based on L which when you consider the very simple case of time, meaning the, 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 the example that we have been using for 50 or 60 years, then you missed it. You, your theory does not apply there. It does apply, for example, for images. In images, the underlying graph, the lattice is undirected. So it applies there. That's one. The second one is think of uh, the graph Laplacian as a second order operator and think of the adjacency matrix as a first order operator. So what you are doing is you are developing a theory that uses second order operators. What are examples of second order operators? Well, second order differential equations. What are examples of first order? Are, they are first order differential equations. Now, if you compose second order operators, like you build your graph polynomial, your filter polynomial with powers of L, you are only getting, say, operators, differential equations that only using L2. So it's like if you studied signal processing and linear systems where the equations were only D2, uh, DT2, or D4, DT4, or D6, DT6, and so forth, polynomials of this sort. While with first order, you can get polynomials with odd and even. So with first, with the, with the, the L operator, in my, a third way of saying this is you are looking at power spectral density kind of signal processing, okay? While with the, the adjacency matrix, we, you are getting the usual DSP kind of thing, extended, of course, to graphs. So this is the advantages. Now, the, the things is that uh, with a more general, and by the way, the, a, the, 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 the theory based on the A can generalize, of course, to the L. Uh, the other way around is more difficult because you cannot handle directed. But, uh, uh, when you have this more general, you lose some nice pro you lose, which means you get the challenge. And one of them for many years for me was the numerical challenge. Okay, because you use MATLAB and you couldn't rely on those results. So I look at this as a, as a good thing uh, in the sense that I'm, I'm still not uh, completely out of business. I can still work on some problems because there are challenges when, when you work with EA, that with EL, um, you get for free, as I mentioned, uh, the numerics of the diagonalization of very easy. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Jose. I think this, this might be a good point, actually, to stop. It's already 2.09. Uh, remember that we have, uh, so we have some uh, meetings coming along. That's on a different Zoom link. Uh, I can send it uh, to you again if you want. No, no, uh, 
You have it. Okay. And, and thank you. Thank you again for joining us. It's, it's been great. And thank uh, everyone for joining uh, this, this talk. So remember that this talk will be uploaded to our YouTube channel in case you want to hear it again or share it with your friends and colleagues and make sure to tune in for future editions of the seminar. So thank you to Jesse once more and thank you all for joining.